So far, we've computed forces inside of a variety of structures. And one of the things we've seen a lot is members that are supporting a load and tension. And so in this video, what we're going to learn about is a little bit how the material behaves when it's subject to tension. So here I have a rubber bar. And if I supply a load to it just by pulling on it, so now the object is in tension, we very clearly see that the object elongates. Now that elongation that we see uh, when an object is in tension is something that's quite universal. So here I have the same material, but it's quite a bit thicker. And if I pull on that, it's a little harder to see, but the object still deforms, but it takes a much, much greater force to get the same deformation. I can also take a bar of steel, which I have here, and here I can pull on it. And now when I pull on this bar, well, it is elongating. It's just elongating such a tiny amount that there's no way you would ever see it on this kind of video. So this is the behavior that we want to understand is what happens to a material when it's subject to tension. So let's describe how we might want to talk about an object in tension. So here's a sketch of a bar attached to a wall. So I'm going to attach the bar to a wall and then we're going to apply a force and pull it downwards. And what we want to look at is what's the difference between the before state and the after state. So here's our before state. Our object has a length L. So when I apply a load P downwards, the object stretches. And what we want to be able to characterize here is what is the change in length. So we're going to look at kind of the before, before load and after load. And this difference in the length we'll call delta. And so what we want to understand is what is the relationship between P, the load, and delta. So here's a very simple tension test with a rubber band. So what we've done here is I've taken these uh, hook here, which I've attached to a table. I've taken another hook, which I attach to a cup. And I just have my rubber band holding the two in between. So here I start with zero grams in the cup. So the cup is empty. Then I take little baggies full of coins and I add 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600 grams. And we see not very surprisingly that the rubber band gets longer. So this is a tension test because it allows me to characterize the deformation of the material, how much it elongates as a function of the load or the weight that I have in the cup. Now you see my little marks here, I put about one centimeter uh, in the initial configuration. So it's about one centimeter here. And you can tell by eye that it's gotten quite a bit longer by the end. If we want to quantify that, all we have to do is kind of line the images up. So here I've lined up each image uh, such that the top bar is following this horizontal line approximately. And now we can clearly see the deformation. And so this kind of test, we could be a little bit more precise with, uh, but it allows us to measure uh, the displacement or the stretch of the rubber band as a function of the load. Now, one can also conduct this kind of test uh, with uh, more realistic construction materials like a bar of steel. However, one has to apply much, much greater loads and the deformation will be much smaller. And so one has to be able to measure the displacement very precisely. However, the basic concept is the same. We apply a load and we measure the deformation. So I can do this kind of test a little bit more quantitatively, but I can also just do it in my house. Uh, so what I've done here is I took a bar of this uh, rubber material, which is 75 millimeters long and a quarter inch square. Uh, sorry for the mixed units, but when you buy this, it comes in quarter inch segments. And so I can use a simple scale uh, used for weighing fish and I can pull on this thing and sort of pull it back and forth a few times and keep measuring the relationship between the force that I'm pulling on this end and this end and the displacement between my two 75 millimeter marks. And the data that I collected is these blue dots. And you can see at least for a little bit of time that we can always describe any function uh, by a line. So if I keep the deformation relatively small, uh, less than say five or 10 millimeters, uh, five for sure, I can represent the function pretty well by a line. But we see that as the load gets greater that we have a kind of nonlinear relationship, but there's still a monotonic relationship the higher the load, the larger the displacement. Of course, I can use a machine which is more precise than using a scale meant for weighing fish and measuring the distance that some marks have moved that I've marked with a pen, uh, but the idea and the concept is quite the same. So now let's look a little more carefully at what happens when we pull on a material in tension. So here I have two pieces of rubber. 
uh, one is very thin, uh, the other has a square cross section. So let's start with the thin one. What I've done here is I've marked the band with one centimeter spacing. So if I look at this on the paper and then I stretch it, I see there now that the in the deformed state, the lines are still straight and the spacing between the lines is preserved, right? So we start off here, one centimeter spacing. We end at a centimeter and a half and notice that the lines stay straight uh, regardless, right? So each one has about the same distance between it in the original state and in the deformed state. Now let's look at the same thing with a thicker bar. Now again, we start off with one centimeter spacing. And if I pull really hard, I can get the same uh, kind of behavior we saw with the thinner band. So it's the same kind of behavior, but the force I'm applying is much greater because uh, this bar has a larger cross-section area. Now let's look at the width. So this band, right, so the two lines there are right with the width. And now as I stretch this out, we notice that as we stretch it, it comes quite a bit thinner. So the more I stretch it, the thinner it becomes. And then it goes back to the original state. So as we pull on it, not only does it elongate, but it gets thinner. We can see the same effect, but probably to a smaller degree with the thicker bar. So let me start off there. It's lined up with those two lines. You can't see them. And the harder I pull it, we start to see uh, that the bar gets thinner and thinner. So those are sort of two observations that'll be important in our understanding of tension. So the material behavior that I'm going to be most interested in is that of the linear elastic solid. When I do my tension test, I apply a load and I measure the displacement. I can describe that relationship with a simple straight line. Now, it seems pretty obvious that the slope of this line depends upon a couple of things, right? So if I take a uh, rubber here and I perform my tension test and let's assume I get this data here, then I take a bar of the same size, but it's of steel. It should seem pretty obvious that uh, the slope should be quite a bit different. And in fact, while I'll exaggerate it here, that's even, even exaggeration because on the scale that I've drawn here with the rubber, there's no way that we can see the deformation of the steel. So steel would have a very steep slope and rubber would have a much shallower slope. Right, so for the, the same load, the displacement is going to be much greater in the rubber. The other dependency that's important is that of cross-sectional area. So here I have uh, rubber and it's uh, one half inch. And now if I take a um, material which is smaller, so here I have a quarter inch, for the same load I ought to get quite a bit more displacement. So the slope should also change with the area. So for a uh, quarter inch rubber, maybe I get something that looks like that. And if we want to think about what the difference is between the slope for different cross-sectional area, uh, that's quite easy to think about. Let's imagine the following situation. I have two bars that are of equal cross-sectional area and I'm going to come in and I'm going to apply an equal load to this. So I'm going to apply a load P to this one and a load P to this one. Now both of these bars are going to deform and if they're made of the same material and they have the same cross-sectional area, we would expect that they would deform by the same amount of delta. Now let's imagine that I take these two bars and I fuse them together. What might happen in that case? Well, we know that if I took markings here and I marked these bars with horizontal lines, in the original configuration, it would look like that. And in the final configuration, the distance between these would elongate a bit, um, but they would remain straight. So we would expect that if I sort of could fuse these together, that there would be no difference. So now I'm going to have a bar over here, which has twice the area that these had. So if these each had cross-sectional area A, this one has cross-sectional area 2A. The length is the same. And so if I apply a load 2P, we would expect that the delta would be the same. So what this leads us to is that when we want to talk about deformation, it's not the force that matters, but it's the force per unit area.
And this idea of force per unit area is something that we call stress. So now let's think about the effect of length. So I'm going to take a bar of length L, cross-sectional area A, and now I'm going to imagine that I come along and I attach another bar to it. This one's going to have the same uh, length, same cross-sectional area. So all I'm really doing is think about what happens if I double the length of the bar and apply a load. In this case, what I can do is I can draw each bar separately with being pulled with a load P. So let's imagine what the initial and the final state is for this bar. So in the deformed configuration, each bar is elongated by an amount delta. So now you can see that when I fuse these two things together and I say, well, what is the final change in length? So now when I fuse these two bars back together, those two deltas that just sort of add to the length, so the total change in the length is two delta. So in this case, we see that the longer the bar, the more the absolute deformation is, right? And so if I keep adding more, longer and longer elements, I apply the same load, the displacement at the end gets longer and longer and longer. And so what this leads us to is a conclusion that it's not the total change in length that ought to be important, but it's the relative change in length. And this is something that we call strain. Let's go back and think about our experiment. So we take a force and we measure displacement. So that allows us to compute this load versus displacement curve. Uh, and if we have a linear elastic solid, uh, what we saw is that's going to be nothing more than a straight line. So now I'm going to want to compare this plot but for two different specimens. So one is gonna have a greater cross-sectional area than the other, otherwise they're the same material. So in order to not have these show up as two different curves, what we learned is that what I wanna do is I wanna plot, instead of the force, the force per unit area, or what we call the stress. And if I do that and plot stress versus displacement, for this case here, I have two specimens, uh, but they're of different cross-sectional area, then I get the same curve. And all that's saying, again, is that if, since this uh, smaller one has a cross-sectional area where four of those, um, four of the smaller ones make one of the bigger one, it just means that, the, that each of these carries one quarter of the total load, and therefore when I normalize by the area, I have the same result. The other way I want to normalize this is not plot displacement, but displacement over length, or what we call the strain. And again, what happens here is if I take a specimen which is one unit long, and I stretch that one, and then I attach two to it, or three to it, or four to it, that I get the same normalized displacement, right? Because each of these moves by the same absolute displacement, that when I put them in a row like this, they add up. And so by taking the strain or the displacement divided by the initial length, if I took a small specimen and a long specimen, and again, plotted in this form, the data would all fall in the same curve. And so by plotting a stress strain curve, what we do is we get data that falls for a particular material. So now we have a particular material, this rubber, which has a curve like that. Again, if I go and I compare my metal bar, my steel bar, I'll also get a stress strain curve, but I'll get one with a much, much steeper slope because it's gonna take much, much more greater force per unit area or stress for me to deform this steel bar versus this rubber bar. But by plotting stress versus strain, we normalize the effect of geometry for an object in tension. So just to summarize and conclude this lecture, for a linear elastic solid, what we will do is we'll assume that stress and strain are proportional to each other by this constant that we usually write with a capital E. And so sometimes you'll see this called the modulus of elasticity, or sometimes you'll see it called Young's modulus. And all that constant is, is the slope of this line here.